Hello, my name is Mike Cornwell. This video, I wanna talk about a expedition that uh, myself and a team went to Asheville uh, in the last couple days. Today I'm recording this and it is uh, Saturday, October 5th. I wanted to do this video because one, I wanted to relay real information. Um, I've noticed that on Facebook, I have like a really hard time looking at Facebook because people pass around just total nonsense. So I wanted to give some real information. Um, I also wanted to use this video kind of for posterity um, as like a reflections on this operation that we did. And I want to encourage other people that when they hear the calling um, that's out there, that they are willing to take the risks and uh, arrive to the challenges that they have out there and especially for their community and to build community locally. Another thing I wanted to do with this video is try to give you an insight because you, you may not have a military background or maybe you do and you don't really see how it might be relevant in the real world. It is very relevant. Um, and I wanna, sh I wanna give kind of some light into some military disciplines that we did um, during this. And lastly, I wanna use this as like a time to give major kudos to the team that's there. So um, this story starts on, um, the hurricane came and hit Northeast Tennessee on Friday at about 11 o'clock. When Saturday came around, uh, a friend of ours knew that, uh, a mutual friend between three of us, he knew that he had a storage unit in Asheville that had, um, their kind of most precious heirlooms and valuable things at a storage facility. Yeah, Sunday, uh, September 29th, he actually drove down to Asheville with his uh, girlfriend and he ended up taking, it took him about 10 hours to actually get there. It normally would take two hours if I-26 wasn't knocked out. And it took him 10 hours to get there. About 10 o'clock a.m. on Monday, September 30th, I received a call from my friend who is currently overseas and he's the person that owns the storage unit. And he was telling me that uh, he, he was kind of asking me if we could go look into the storage unit. And he had told me that my friend Leland had gone down there. So I go and I call Leland and I start talking to him and I was like, hey, um, you know, uh, what we really need to do, I actually, I was encouraging my friend to come back and that when he comes back, we would all go down there together to go get his stuff. And so, there's some complexity to this. And so I, I started talking to Leland on the phone, going down there and getting his stuff. And he said, oh, you should probably call him back because he's not thinking that. He thinks that you're going to go on your own with this group of people to go get this stuff. And so um, that's not what I was planning on doing. So I call him back and my friend David, and he tells me that he is stuck on an island in Italy. And all of the thing, he started telling me the contents of that uh, storage unit. Uh, and I've since found out more of the contents of that storage unit. And, and this is a pretty, this is, this is definitely kind of a nightmare situation that people might have that um, they ended up as kind of background, they ended up um, moving all of their stuff into storage and then going on a vacation. And then this all hit while they're on vacation and the storage unit, they had two storage units. One of them had basically all of their like actual valuables in it. And so that was the one th that, uh, that had issues. I found out about Leland going and doing the scouting down there and that he had found a way to get down there through the mountains and all this kind of craziness. And so as I'm talking to my friend David, he's basically telling me and like making me very crystal clear and aware of what's happening that it was going to take him a long time to get back, that if they were lucky, he'd be able to be back in about five days. And so... At this time, uh, Leland starts sending out photos of the storage unit and we can see it like, he's like, hey, all the stuff is there, it's splayed out and it's like, it's just, it's totally wide open. And so uh, based on the amount of devastation that we had started seeing about Asheville, there's a ton of uncertainty flying around. You gotta understand that whenever these things are happening, you don't really know what's happening. Um, you just hear rumors about things and it's like, unless you see it with your, cell, your own eyes, you don't really know. And so it started dawning on me that um, I was going to have to put together an expedition to go down there and go get this stuff, um, or at least get the most valuable things. And I'll admit, I really did not want to do that. Um, I, To me, the, the dangers were very clear. Um, the roads 
no understanding of what the roads would be. Uh, we did not know whether or not there would be looters or any other kind of like hostels that were there. Um, it was also pretty clear to me that um, the legal grayness of doing this, because this is at a storage unit and yet his stuff is there, but he had very valuable things there. And so, you know, playing that all in. And then most importantly, the thought that we're going to go down there um, and all this uncertainty for some stuff and real people, part of my group, um, I'm, I'm putting them, I'd be asking them to go into harm's way for this stuff. So I eventually, after talking to David, uh, I got off the phone with him and I was like, crap, we're going to have to do this. So I called Leland up and I said, okay, we're doing this. And we started organizing and this was about 10, maybe 11 o'clock on that Monday, October or uh, September 30th. And we had less than 24 hours. Um, I, d I decided that we were going to launch at 4.30 a.m. on Tuesday, October 1st to go and do this. And in the meantime, I needed to get as many people as possible to try to go do this disaster recovery. So I started making phone calls. And I called all of um, all of the the people in my close group that I could. It's hard to make these calls. You under, gotta understand, like the cells down, and some of the people that I was trying to get a hold of, they're not like um, they're not normally in cell signal in a good day. And so, trying to get a hold of these people. And after I, I, I locked on uh, one person, I started realizing that the security situation there could be really bad, really bad. And so I was like, we need like actual professional security. And while I have a Marine Corps background, I've been into a combat zone. Um, I know that I would be bringing a bunch of people who have no military experience. And while they would be perfectly comfortable carrying a weapon, using that weapon and or uh, doing the de-escalation techniques necessary that a security person might do, they don't have any, they have no skills in that. So I end up calling a friend of mine who uh, he's got a range here locally, his name's Sean. And he is a former special forces guy. And I called him up and <laughs> you can understand like the amount of like butterflies in my stomach as I'm organizing this. Cause it's continuing to dawn on me that we're getting ready to go do this. Um, and uh, I called him up and I said, dude, we, we need help. There's like, you know, there's all this, there's all this stuff and we're trying to go and recover it. And sure enough, he said, yes. I did not think, I had no idea whether or not he was gonna say yes. And I felt a lot better because uh, we wouldn't have to do security necessarily together. I could actually dedicate that person um, to being the security team. And so I started making more and more phone calls. And I called another person who was a former police officer who's also a medic. And I talked to him. I explained to him the whole kind of situation. And immediately he said he was in. He has a really big truck and a dump trailer. So already when I talked to Leland, he was... Um, securing a mini skid steer. He was going to tow that with his truck. We now had another friend who has a big truck with the dump trailer. We had a security team that we were going to have. Uh, and then another friend of mine who said that he would join uh, is a, you could say like a professional, like handyman con construction type person. And then lastly, I called an, another friend of mine who, uh, Robert, who is a like a, a real commercial electrician. So not just like doing residential or something like that, but doing like extremely, extremely high amperage and voltage lines at like factories and like big industrial stuff. So he knows like he knows big electricity. And so this was the team. And another front, another friend of mine um, was with uh, Tyler, the, uh, the the handyman as well. And so, sure enough, I immediately once I got those phone calls going, I'm getting my wife to go and start getting the preparations going. Um, I had her go and like start making an order at at Lowe's for Leland to go by and pick up. We started organizing, getting gas cans together because there was we we were under the assumption that there would be no fuel going all the way to Asheville and back. And we're towing equipment with 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 multiple vehicles. Um, we started getting like hard hats and vests and things like that. I started putting together. I wanted to try to wrap some of this in a more kind of legal justification. And I put I had to put together a contract with my friend to basically uh, to pay my business to go do this disaster recovery. And so we put all our we got all our ducks in a row, and it was just madness all day, 
until I needed to prepare for a briefing that I was going to give with everybody, bring them all together at 7.30 at my house. And so we started this briefing. And by this point, I, I had tried to have some, some routes plotted, plotted out in a typical what's called a five-paragraph order in, in, um, in military speak. And what that has is it talks about the situation on the ground, what, what exactly is the mission, what is the nature of the hostile forces that are around? What are the nature of the friendly forces to include the different people that were there? And to generally answer questions and to provide as clear a picture as we can as we're getting ready to embark on this. And so uh, we had that at my house. We also had kind of like a group meeting there. It was, it was probably more chaotic than I would have liked. Too many bodies. And I'm giving this and... I think everybody was feeling it too. Like you're this is kind of like an energy that, you know, on your, on like your skin of like, there's uncertainty and we know we're getting ready to go jump into a bunch of uncertainty. And so, um, Leland wasn't there for that briefing and he was coming, coming late cause he had to get some bunch, a bunch of stuff. And so when he finally came, we, we started doing some of the other part of the planning that really needed to happen ahead of time so that we can like kind of uh, brief people. And he started breaking down, um, the site itself and what the challenges were that we were going to face. And as much as I thought that we were going to be just fine, I started getting an understanding of these challenges. I'm like, this is going to be really hard, like, like really hard. Um, there's down power lines everywhere. The one access into the location, the, the entire parking lot would be full of mud. We didn't know of what extent or what the nature of this mud. He, he went there and he, he got some pictures and got kind of a general understanding we started talking to him. Um, the more he talked, the more he talked, the less confidence I actually had to be perfectly honest, because I'm like, this is a lot of stuff we have to do just to even attempt to get access, just to attempt to get access to this stuff. We were going to have to clear mud. We we're going to have to clear, clear ways. We were going to have to somehow back trailers in. It was, this is like madness. Um, so then, um, once we were done with that, everybody left except uh, Leland and I and his girlfriend. We came, we came back here in my office to plan the route out because they said, oh, the, the route that you've chosen is, is not real. That's not going to happen. So they start showing me the path. And at this point, like, uh, I mean, you can understand there's no cell signal. Uh, as far as we know, there's no way that we're going to GPS this because any one of the roads that they're going to send us on may or may not have been closed. And so I had this route, but I had the maps just in case people needed them. And... He starts telling me the route and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, they could not really remember exactly like the names of the roads and stuff. And we we're sitting there trying to follow it on the map. And I eventually got to the end and I was like, man, we are not going to be able to. I was like trying to plot it out. Google Maps, terrible for this. I would highly recommend if anybody were to do it, you need to plot a very specific route. Do not use Google Maps. It doesn't want to do that. It wants to pick all the routes for you. Don't do that. It's... Um, but we start trying to plot out the routes and the, the the technology, which by the way, the technology all day we were fighting, um, it was getting completely in the way. And so um, the more he talked about the route, the less certain I became about the route. And the more I, I realized I'm gonna, we are gonna have to rely entirely on them to show us the way. And that is really, that's uh that you don't necessarily want that. You, you need like, you need backups. But we're all going to go down a bunch of random roads and, and oftentimes in directions in which we would not normally have gone. They were not direct routes. We were going south and kind of made sense where we're going to go. And then we we're going to peel off in a completely different direction to go through the mountains after this storm just knocked out all the roads and all the power lines. And we're going to go through this random road and we're going to like turn here and there and here and there. Dude, um, that that's terrifying. So finally, we're like, okay. You're going to be the lead car carrying the thing, which is kind of good because he's the slowest. He was the slowest vehicle. And I should also mention, uh, we amazingly, Amazon was able to deliver us uh, radios um, within two days. And so I got some, um, some like real radios and um, I didn't know how to use them whatsoever. We're kind of like faux using them as we're going throughout the day. Like there's no time really to get prepped. Normally you would have prep time. You would do training. You would do some exercises. You would do some, um, a little bit better layout of the ground. We didn't have any of that. And so, um, you know, we're getting ready to do this convoy. I don't even know how to use the freaking radios. 
And there's no comms. There's no way for us to actually communicate back to or to anyone else if we have any troubles. So um, everybody went home and they, they, kind of, they kind of started doing their own prep. Again, we were going to get up and be ready to go at a person's house at 4.30 in the morning uh, to, to step out. And so I try to, go, try to go to bed after getting my stuff together. And I think I laid down at about 10. And I don't think I actually got to sleep till probably 12.30. And then I woke up again at about 2.30 and couldn't go back to sleep. And it's one of those things that when you know you've got an operation that's coming up and there's so little intelligence, there's so much uncertainty, and you've, you're you the person who's asked, <laughs> asked people to commit themselves to, to doing this, dude, it was hard to sleep. It was very hard to sleep because I had to try everything um, in my in any of my past training to try and get um, my mind to calm down so that I could get sleep, which was going to be needed because we were going to be working our butt off all day. This was a one day operation period. So finally four o'clock rolls around. I get up, I load the last bit of stuff. I have like, <laughs> I had like 10, 10 five gallon containers of gasoline in my, my Honda car. It was ridiculous. I had to roll, I had to drive with all the windows down because of the amount of fumes that were coming out of this car. So anyway, so I finally get there and we start unloading this stuff and people start coming in and I'll be darned, the entire team showed up on time before 4.30, uh, except for the person whose house we were at that we were mustering and I had to poke him multiple times and eventually came out. But um, we all made it at 4.30. I then gave the kind of the final briefing, which talked about where the car, who was gonna be in the cars, who's gonna be following whom. I found out that uh, Sean, our security team, had additional radios and I gave him mine and he went and programmed and set them all up uh, in such a way that we were able to communicate. Um, we got all of our stuff and we started heading down the road. Now, one of the things that we knew was um, generally these radios, um, we did not want to call, we, 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 we employed military discipline uh, with the radios um, our entire way to Asheville. And what that means is we use the, we use the radios, like normal radios, non-military radios actually broadcast over the air and it's open and clear. And so um, we did not want to necessarily give away what we're doing, where we're going, who is there, or anything like that. We did not try, we, we intentionally stayed off the radios just in case somebody is, you know, I don't know, scanning for radios. Apparently people do that kind of stuff. Um, so we, we had really good discipline. And one of the things that we did, this is kind of a, a good tip, is if you've got a convoy of people and uh, you've got very limited comms, every single person had a radio, which was great. Next, um, uh, the command vehicle, we ended up having not the front vehicle. We had it the second vehicle. I probably would have chose the third vehicle out of a, a five car convoy to, to be more of a command vehicle. But what we found was we had our security guy in the back, basically making sure that every time we did turns or this or that, that um, or there was some sort of obstacle that they would call out on the radio and basically say, okay, everybody's passed. What we then found out is the, the command vehicle basically needed to relay that message so that everybody to include the front car would get it because sometimes they were not getting, they were not getting the radios. And so uh, we did this kind of the entire way and obviously it's dark and we're going through mountain passes. And, you know, at one point we had to go through an area where the road was blocked. And so um, our friend Leland had told us this, that, hey, we're going to go through this thing where it says the road's closed, but we've seen people coming and going on it. So, and we went that route. So it's, it's safe. And we went, so we started going, I'll tell you, it was actually a lot better than we were thinking. And it was starting to kind of shore up our confidence because believe it or not, the mountain roads, now this is not about all the roads. This is about, we went down one clean road. And yeah, there was some work that had been done uh, days prior where they had cut a bunch of trees up. Apparently, just within that 24 hours of Leland going down those roads, they had been cleaned up. 
we start going down there and we notice that there was actually cell signal on those mountains. That was nice. So I could actually give some uh, some updates back to back home, back to our friend out in Italy and start to give them kind of some updates. And as daytime, daytime started coming on, we started feeling a bunch more confidence. Now I'll say uh, just before we got to Spruce Pine, which is where how we kind of got into um, got into North Carolina, we uh, like we basically went through the mountains from Irwin and Unicoi across the mountains over to, to Spruce Pine, and then we went down to Asheville. And as we started getting close to Spruce Pine and really Bakersville, the there were so many um, streams, like big streams, that clearly had done so much damage. Like the the number of bridges we saw that were out, the amount of sand and rock that was everywhere. We saw cars flipped upside down, like hillsides washed out. It was a lot. So, so we eventually get out. We saw we got through go through Bakersville, the and they had a bunch of damage there, but it, it wasn't too bad. And so oh, we're so we're, we're finally out, and we're on the main road. I think it's Highway 19 West. The fact that there is literally soil on the going from Spruce Pine across, um, you know, going from east to west, and then you go straight down on 26 to Asheville. And when we left Spruce Pine, dude. The destruction on that road that was, was crazy. There was like literally, like the way I could describe it is like, there was this one section on the side of the road where clearly the water got like crazy, that it flipped over this massive fluid container that uh, like like a like a wa like a storage tank. It could have been water, it could have been fuel. We have no idea what, but this thing was easily. 25 to 30 feet tall, maybe 25 feet tall and 30 to 40 feet wide. And this thing was turned sideways so that you could see the bottom of it. Dude, that was massive. This is massive. We saw like semi trucks flipped over. We saw cars sitting on top of cars. I don't remember where, and I don't remember if it's in the video or not, but there was this one part where I literally saw three cars stacked on top of each other. They had just, waters had just collided together and they just like caught and they were all there. Just massive destruction on, on uh, Highway 19. Eventually though, uh, halfway through Highway 19, it wasn't all that bad. It was every now and again, you'd cross a bridge and that bridge would have silt on the bridge. In other words, the water was way over the top of the bridge and was depositing material onto that bridge. And luckily it didn't destroy the bridge, which is kind of amazing. But I think there was enough flow that it probably wasn't enough to actually push the bridge. Yep. But you'd look over, and I've got That's the videos kind of, of it, of like wherever the water normally was, was just like widened so much. And like, you know, maybe the banks were like this, and now the banks were like this. It was crazy. And then you'd look out on the other side where uh, it was like more flat, and you could just see just a sea of destroyed everything. Trees, houses, RVs, everything. It was just tossed all over the place. And so... We, we finally make it to highway or uh, I-26 and we go down and start going south. They, we didn't really see much damage, to be honest. Um, every now and again, we'd see like a little bit of like uh, some trees down or something like that. It wasn't until we got into Asheville proper that we started, we started seeing it. And so if you've ever been to Asheville, like, you know, I'm seeing on the picture here, like imagine... It's kind of like a big bowl, that whole area. And Asheville is like in the middle of it. And going around Asheville is like a, there's like a river, kind of goes like this. And so what we saw was like, when you look over to the right side, when you're coming down on I-26, there's this whole river district where there's like some construction and like industrial uh, warehouses and stuff. Like one of them I remember there is a, um, it's a PVC pipe plant. They build PVC pipes. Dude, there was PVC pipes oh, everywhere. Oh, I can only imagine how much were washed down that road. They're just the scattered PVC everywhere. Place, in that same place, they everywhere. had started building like, uh, like on the restaurants river. and they had built like South bars South and all this other kind of stuff. Like, and when we looked down there, dude, it was, this whole area oh my destroyed. goodness, the amount of destruction. Literally everything was destroyed. Everything. I, I can only imagine how high that water was. Literally everything was destroyed. You'd see yeah. buildings broken in half. You'd see like semi trucks, like out in the middle of a pasture, like turned upside down. Um, it was a lot. 
Building now, totally uh, where we needed to go was along another part of the river on the east side of, of uh, Asheville. And we started going around. And again, we really didn't see much damage around in Asheville. I'm, I'm sure there is. But uh, from what we could see on uh, 440 and, and whatnot, we, we really didn't see much. A couple trees down. And so then we finally get off the road. They don't have any power. There isn't really a lot of cars out. There's onesies, twosies. Uh, and, and you, what you got to understand is like right now is like prime time for, um, for school, like in September school's back in session. It's a college town, but you're not really finding much people out at all. And so this is when it starts getting much more kind of intense. Like, you know, the hair's starting to stand on the back of your neck. Cause you're going, we're going to an industrial district that's been destroyed and we're running a five car convoy through an urban area where there's like no lights on the streets and we're trying to stay together and we're trying to minimize our radio traffic and stuff like that. And so we're like on the, on the radio, like making sure we're all there and like trying to like group and like keep together. Biggest thing possible. You gotta understand. I'm surprised if you don't have cell signal and the only thing that you got rate is radios, you can get out of radio contact. Now, luckily these are strong enough that it wouldn't be too much of an issue, but it's difficult to coordinate and get everybody together. Because we were gonna stay together and we're gonna leave together. That's telecom. This actually looks really good for us. That's telecom. That's there, right there. Yeah. Look at that. There's a guy parked right there. That looks like that road is passable now when probably it wasn't passable. We're before. going over there because I can see yeah, we're on going the other right side there. of that, I think. Because that's the trucking. Oh, okay. One left. Got glass. Uh, okay. This, this, is, this yeah. is it right here. Yeah, that's it. I wonder if we can move that stump. With the, the thing. I see. We'll chain to it and move with the truck. Yeah, I bet you this bro is trying to find his stuff. Let's holler at him. I think you're just going to pull right there, man. Dude, I would totally drive in there. In that mud? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Eventually to come out to where the storage unit was and massive destruction. We basically went and parked. We knew what we were gonna do is we were gonna get there. We had to, the first things first, we had to make a decision on how exactly are we gonna get the dump trailer into position as close as we can in order to get the stuff in it as fast as possible. And we needed to assess what was the entry like and we were gonna use the skid steer to basically move mud and stuff like that and, and get an understanding of what, how exactly were we gonna do this. And what we wanted to do was be able to back the trailer directly up to the opening of the storage facility, grab the stuff we needed, put it in the dump trailer and get out of there. When we got there, that became very apparent that that was not gonna happen. The amount of mud and silt that was sitting in that parking lot was at least a foot tall. And if you were to back up a heavily loaded trailer on there, uh, the, the truck would have sank and would not have been able to get out even with four wheel drive. This mud and silt was bad. In any location in which this, uh, we, we quickly found it, where any of this stuff has any amount of water to it, you would sink and it would be difficult to get out. This, uh, this mud was, um, it smelled awful. It clearly was anaerobic. Uh, which means it like off gases, like kind of gross, oh, gr man. gross smells. Yeah. Okay. And it was pretty gross. So we get, we get our, like our hard hats on, we get our vests on and we start making the assessment. What we decided was we were going to use the skid steer to basically yeah. clear the sidewalk and try to walk out. items out and, or use the skid steer to basically pick up items and then drive them out. So we start getting to it. Our security team starts going around the facility and making sure that not just people, but anything and everything that could be dangerous is not so dangerous. So he's off doing that. Immediately our uh, commercial electrician went inside and we start kind of pointing to all the various wires. Like, what is that? What is that? Can we cut that? What's, you know, and he basically is like, this whole place is dead. You do not have to worry about uh, power going out. I mean, there's literally power lines everywhere, all over the place, not in the building, but outside of it. 
And he's like, you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. And so we started cutting all the various wires to get out of the way. The whole facility had mesh metalness and like rolled up doors and they were like, they were everywhere, just totally blocking the way in. And inside the building, there was at least a foot of mud everywhere inside of that building. And some places there was like giant piles that might be like three, four foot high. Luckily that was like well-drained. And so you could actually kind of walk on it, but everything else, the lowest areas where water was pooling, if you stepped in that, it, it could take you minutes to get out. And so uh, very quickly we realized that we can't just like get to work. We actually have to build on a, a, a platforms in order to yeah, be able to even to start to look at stuff. Fire. So um, it's by, it's like uh, our, right. our handyman, Tyler, and uh, uh, Robert brought um, yeah, this is, uh, pretty uh, grinders I, I kind of and started grinding the metal and cutting it and so that we could fold the, uh, the metal kind of chain link down and put it down on the mud. We basically, yeah, anything that we could grab that we could stand on so we could. And so we started doing that. We started pulling some stuff out. We found, um, we found my friend's unit. And we found some of this stuff. It was very low on the priority of list. I had a, I had a giant list of priority items uh, or items yeah. prioritized to basically go and find. And so we had a bunch of different precious items we were looking for, artwork and, and the sort and like fairly, uh, family heirlooms and stuff like that. And so we just start digging. Very quickly, maybe about 20 to 40 minutes in, the equipment, I, I kind of, pop outside and I look and our skid steer basically isn't moving anymore. And basically they were having a massive problem with it. <laughs> so you gotta understand this is a rental three hours away in an area where we're trying to work very fast to get up and going and our equipment is already down. One of the most important lessons that you could possibly learn um, that people learn in the military, especially as they do real, real ops out in the real world, you can have a great plan. And up to this point, our plan was going perfectly absolutely perfectly better than we had thought it was going to be. And now we got our first problem. Our primary piece of equipment to be able to evac that, that stuff out of there went down. So, um, our medic, who's also our driver and, uh, Leland, who, who knows a good bit about uh, heavy equipment, they immediately spent their time focused on that piece of equipment, getting it back up, making phone calls, doing everything they had to do. They literally broke that thing apart and started you know, trying to get it together. So while that was going, we went back inside and um, looking at my list here. Yeah, we already start having a really hard time finding anything. It was, it was, it was shocking, man. I had, I had photos of the inside of the building, inside of that, um, inside of the unit. So I could see what all the boxes look like and all the various stuff. I, I had schematics of exactly where these things were supposed to be. And we're on the spot and we could not find any of it. We're just going through mud, we're finding stuff, all sorts of stuff that is not ours or, or not, not part of what we're looking for. And man, it does, not, it does not go very well. We ended up finding some items we start kind of pulling it off to the side. In hindsight, we started pull, we should have been pulling those items out as we found them. And so we keep working on, it. we probably, we probably went for two solid hours until we noticed when we got there, there was some fresh wood that was just sitting there. We're like, what the heck is this wood? Obviously somebody's here. They're going to be building something. And so of course, of course, some people were like, Hey, we should use this wood and, and put it down so we could walk on it. That would have been fun. And that would have been nice, but, uh, we, we didn't want to like, you know, cause any trouble with like some contractors or something like that. So we just left it be. So eventually the contractors showed up and they're like, uh, Hey, uh, you know, we, we were called to come in here and actually close this whole place up. And we're like, uh Oh, so I'm like, okay, I pulled away to go talk with this guy and our uh, former police, uh, guy with us. We basically start trying to negotiate with this guy. And so our guys are still working and he is the contractor is getting more and more concerned about us being in here. And so we told him, I brought him over. I showed him the contract. Uh, I showed him some a, emails. Not a color, it's a wood and, handle. Uh, I showed him a bunch of the documentation saying, hey, okay, we're, we're, we're here for a very specific purpose. He didn't like that. One, one it's hard to describe um, these kind handle. of contractors. Like They're very right like, um, they have a master. They listen to what that person says, and that's it. They're not. They're they're just a they're just like a supervisor PM. Yeah. 
And so we realize we're dealing with that. And he starts getting more and more irate that he's just like, you guys can't be here. You've got to go. We're like, okay. And we're trying to we're we're trying to see like, hey, is your guy coming here so we can actually talk to him? And he wouldn't give us like any information. He was definitely stonewalling us. And so eventually I started feeling a little uncertain about it. So I kind of called everybody off like, hey, stop working on this stuff. Uh, we did get the equipment up and working. A belt came off it and they fixed that belt. And they were, start, and they were starting to get back to it when these I got, guys came I got up. like super stuck. But like I started right kind of peeling people back, like, like come back. And at shovel. this point, we really, it, it seemed like we were finding less and less and less the more that we were there. Don't think so. Now, Leland was actually going around like, and kind of, total uh, instead one. of looking on the actual site, he was going like far and wide inside the, the unit to find stuff. And little did we know that he was actually back there finding, actually finding some of the items. Dude, I don't know what to say. So we're talking to this guy and then eventually I was just no. like, okay. Um, we're going to step back and we're going to wait till this guy shows up and then we're going to try to try to get ourselves back in there. We tried to negotiate with this guy a hundred million times. Very possible. It, it was, we were, it. It we was were not like talking right here. to the right person. So I, I don't think it's here. And so we pulled him back. We were trying to grab, hey, we're going to grab the few things that are ours or whatever and that we found. And he's like, oh, you can't touch any of that stuff. And I was like, oh my goodness. And so I'm like, okay, we're going to grab our stuff. So we went and grabbed our stuff. And so Leland uh, has much more attachment to David, our, our friend who we're helping out. And so when people weren't looking, he went in there and actually grabbed a bunch of the stuff and, and brought it back out. So of the stuff that we were able to actually recover, you know, kudos goes out to Leland for just going for it and just making it happen. The situation here is that these guys are the only ones that have kicked us out. The cops don't care. No, they don't give a shit. Um, they took our license plates, but that's fine. Who did? Just, I mean, they, I, they went around and took pictures. Yeah, they, oh, that's fine. they're just yeah, making sure. Fine. Um, yeah. Huh. So should we just? They said they're calling the, the the owners to come. Like the owners live here. He said he called the owner and the owner's coming. So we said to win. He said I don't know. We'll find out. Let's find out. I, I, okay. Yeah, so he, I'm not, he made it. I'm not, he so made I'm not, it clear that he he. He he's playing he's playing the I'm gonna tell you but I'm not gonna t I'm not gonna yeah. like reply back. So and not one to fist fight this guy. Permission from said owner who's yeah. showing up that we can go in there. Yeah. And at least or get the shit that we already know about that's right there. Because this is a fucking pile of mountain house that we know is David's. Yeah. And we have a list of property. We absolutely we have a list of property and it's not trivial property. Yeah. And we can very easily identify all of it, it all has serial yeah. numbers, etc. Oh gosh, I think I have photos from moving out of Austin of some things like that chair. I think I have photos of that. I don't chair. think that fucker's coming either. No. I grabbed the chair. It's gone. You got it. No, 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 no. I mean the the oh. owner dude. Oh, oh yeah. That sounds like nonsense. Then we need to go. I agree. Well so look. We have fucking no idea and the more we dug the less we found. Yeah. To be honest. We the the mountain house was like that whole corner we were making success. To your point, it might have made sense to continue going back there. I don't know if you heard, but I started walking down this hallway and he had there was step up his step down at the end yeah. of this hallway. Like, I think the water came in and blew it that way. Yeah. And it could, all that shit could have traveled. This is um, fucking infuriating. So look, if nothing else, let's just get packaged up. Yeah, we should definitely get packaged up. I'm worried about these guys. They don't know Asheville, and they don't. I told, know I told, I told, I told him to, I, I told them to go to the downtown. Yeah. We got a radio. Yeah. There's probably cell signal. Yeah. I've gotten cell signal most of the there places. There's 5G right now. Yeah. There's yeah. some signal boosters. You have 5G? Around, like, yeah. Somebody over there we can call. And, yeah. So, okay. I, I agree. So, I said, where are you going? Sean said, well, we'll figure it out. We'll send you a text or something. Right. So he, gonna yeah, I told, I, I told what's his name. No, oh, we're talking about getting somebody. That's good. Go to downtown. Yeah. I want to go see if White Duck is here. Did you know there's a White Duck? I did not know that. Yeah. The building might be here. Why would that be used for my behinds at Grandview? Yeah, that guy's cool. Alright, let's load up let's load up. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's load, let's move. I think what time is it? It's like morning. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's like eleven forty. Oh, talk time. Talk time. Yeah. Alright. Talk on a coat. I want to talk on a coat. I gotta I gotta switch shoes because right now I probably have some open sores right now that are These screaming are at me. Shoes. <laughs> Hey, at least we got the Blu ray. We got the Blu rays and we got the painting. You got a painting? At we least it wasn't an absolute piece of shit painting. Well, as long as they're the, essen they're the essential oil. They're so the we essential got them. one.
I think so. And so we pull back and we're, we're deciding to wait. And so we're like, you know what? I'm going to send everybody out except for uh, Leela and his girlfriend and myself and uh, our uh, medic, Jason, uh, to basically wait for this guy. And so we're starting to wait around. We basically put the equipment up and eventually this guy finally shows up and he, we were looking at him at a distance cause he pulled up and he immediately, like he didn't really talk to us and he went off. We're like, okay. And so I was watching him and it was funny cause he was wearing, it's so obvious that he worked for like the company cause he had slacks on, he had a polo that was like matching the color of the, 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 the business and stuff like that. So we're like, okay, this guy, I'm like, this guy's just a management dude. He's not, he's not an owner or something like that. And so he finally comes back up and I'm like, Hey, my name is Mike. Da 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 da. This is why we're here. We're trying to do this thing. We're basically explaining to him and we start talking to him. And I could tell something was not right with this guy. Like he was just like kind of slow to respond. Uh, like he was kind of thinking things, but not really thinking about what we're talking about. He was, he was like in Beverly. He's like, okay, you know, whatever, you know? And so we were just like really Im 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 imparting on him. Like, Hey, he has been trying to get a hold of you guys because there are stuff in here that we need to get. There is important stuff in here. We need to obtain this stuff. And so, um, he eventually agrees and I'll play some video. I, I have some video of him telling this next story I'm about to tell you, and I'm going to show that in the video. And so, um, he, he starts telling us, uh, he, he said, he gave us a bunch of corporate nonsense about, oh, we're sending out emails and yada, yada, yada. But then he talked about, yeah, we're talking about bringing people in one at a time to be able to basically find their stuff. I was like, okay. And I was like, it would be really nice if we could be the first on that list so we can get these things because these things are valuable things that we do not want to be lost to somebody who's just finds them and then, hey, now they're walking away with somebody else's stuff that no one can account for. Because we had a list to include with serial numbers of precious items to, to leave with. And so we start talking to him and he gives a, he starts telling us that he was like, yeah, I was here when it happened. We're like, okay. He's He starts telling us that he was like maybe on the phone or something and they were telling him, hey, they're about to, you know, there's all this rain coming down. It's like, they're about to release the dam. And he was like, he was like there, maybe he was backed up the hill just a little bit. And he's like, yeah, I, I saw the floodwaters come in and wash people away off the road. And he's like, I tried calling 911 and it took, I think he said like two hours, maybe an hour for somebody to show up. And it's like, yeah, they didn't find these people. And it's like, that's why this guy looked shell shocked. So they actually released the dam in order to prevent it from blowing, I guess. Yeah. Oh Lord. God. I didn't realize that. That's what happened. That's why everything's so bad. No. All right. I guess we should out. Thank you. He seen something about him seemed a little bit loose, a little bit lucid, a little slow, and I was like, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. He's being asked to come here and like do a damage survey on this building that he's a manager of. But in the back of his mind, what he's really thinking about is like, holy crap, I almost died and all, I watched people get killed. Yeah, real stuff. Um, the destruction at this place, I've got a lot of video of it, or a reasonable amount of video of it. It, it cannot be understated. They, there was like a, it, it's like a, like a truck area, like they work on trucks or something. It was just like flipped over semis everywhere and trees on stuff and 
buildings have collapsed. There was a, there's like a golf course and there was like literally the whole thing was sand, like a foot tall of mud and sand, just absolutely everywhere. It looked like a desert. Um, it looked terrible. And there was, there's all sorts of other things that are, you know, minor events about this kind of stuff. Like, um, search and rescue came and talked to us and I'll I'll never forget looking at these guys and they're like chiseled, like in shape, rocking and rolling. And I looked at them like those dudes, those dudes are the real heroes right there. Like, holy crap. Um, and so, uh, we saw like, uh, some fire firefighters came up and we were talking to them. We, I think, trying to think if we talked to some police maybe we did maybe we didn't i don't think we did i think we did talk we did talk to them uh we talked to some other people and there's no proverbial nosy neighbors walking up and down this road all the time because this is right next to a subdivision and so we talked to all sorts of people and they told us that the water had gotten over the top of the building that just to put that in perspective that is easily 18 foot tall now note where the river is over there, that water is probably normally 10 feet below the banks. So that water had to pretty much been 30 feet high in order to have done that. And when we looked at the building, um, I, I've seen some other buildings around here that are storage units that are similar. You basically have, uh, you have like the building, right? And the sides of the building are basically brick. And then in the middle here, you basically have glass uh, here in the middle and like that. And you got your like little doors or whatever. What we found was all of the, the units that were behind the brick sections were actually generally okay. But that middle, somebody described it as a washing machine. And that's the way to think about it. It was literally tumbled like this. It was a freaking mess. My only thoughts is probably what happened was the water came. I don't know if it came super rushing, but it, you know, it got up high enough maybe. And at some point it rushed inside of there and just went, just blew everything to the side. Leland, like I said, ended up finding a bunch of uh, our friend's stuff, like tucked away in the, in the aisles far away from where it should have been. It just went blasted out. So at this point, we basically got kind of our closer. We had to close it down. This is about 12 o'clock. We got there at, I think like 8.30. So we got probably about two, two and a half hours of real work in. And we moved a lot of stuff. Let me tell you what, we really made some progress, but I'll tell you, we did not find any of the primary valuables. Um, Those obstacles were worse than we thought. Um, so just know this, if you were to ever go and do any kind of uh, disaster recovery, um, be prepared, be prepared. Um, it was good. We brought a change of clothes and stuff like that. It was just disgusting. My feet were gross. You know, I had sunk in, in mud so far that it went beyond my boots. My boots are like, you know, a foot tall, maybe more. And mud had gotten obviously in there and all of my feet, my socks. And it was disgusting. Um, so we basically, uh, I sent, I had sent everybody away. We basically got together and we, we go to a rallying point just kind of across the road there. And in order to do that, we started making our way around. And I, I think I may or may not have a video of this and just looking at the destruction. Oh my goodness. It was so ridiculous. I remember being over the top of a bridge and looking down at a, um, a U-Haul storage place. And it was just like, just all the tops were gone and just stuff everywhere. Um, I don't know why they put all these storage units uh, by the by the river, but that's what they did. And I think it's just because that's where industrial crap goes. So we finally meet up. There's still no power anywhere. We were trying. We were just trying to get food. We're like, okay, it's noon. Let's just go get a good meal. Let's like recover and you know go from there. And we could not find a meal anywhere. And so eventually we're like, okay, we're gonna head out of here. And at this point, mission's over. Um, we're we're basically letting our hair down. We're trying to increase spirits because everybody's kind of dejected that we we really weren't that successful. Um, we were successful in some ways, and I'll talk about them at the end, but we, we weren't able to find these goods. Um, we were able to get a, the phone number and the name of that guy so that my friend might have a, an opportunity to go and speak with them. But then, um, 
uh, we started like you know having fun on the radio and like having real conversations and stuff. And so we're going, we're trying to go back the way that we came, and we got all the way back. And I did a bunch of more video on the way back to to Spruce Pine, and we tried to go back the way we came, and we ended up getting blocked by police. And they basically were like, "Hey, we're trying to repair these roads over here, and like shore them up." And so we had, they were like, "Yeah, you can go this other way." We're like, "Okay, I don't know about that." And so we start, we we get diverted, and we are trying to make our way back to town to Bakersville. And man, there's so many, there was so much random damage. Uh, we found like a fifth wheel that was like down and it was like destroyed. And I'll never forget, Robert gets on the radio. He's kind of, he's kind of a smart ass. And he was just like, ah, don't worry, it'll, it'll buff out. <laughs> I think I might have a picture of it or something. It's, it's so messed up. He's like, oh yeah, it'll buff out. At the end of the day, all these places turn back into what Appalachia kind of like historically was anyways. Uh, most people don't know that, but... So anyways, we start going a completely different route. And what we find out is we're basically going the route to uh, Carver's Gap. It's basically the North Carolina Tennessee border where Carver's Gap is at the tippy top of the mountain. And it's like on a ridge on either side is the different states. And you can do a ton of hiking there. It's a, it's a real great place to get up there. At one point in time, there was like roads that were really washed out. And we had to go and cross these roads with like towing equipment and stuff. It was nuts. I mean, you're talking like there was really not much more room than like the width of a vehicle, barely even enough for the the, the wider trailer wheels to get over over these um, these holes. But uh, generally, that that path was fine. Once we got over Car Carver's Gap, I don't know why we kind of felt like we're home sailing. So we go down. We eventually stop. We rally everybody up. We see, we see the different goods that we got and we basically have our kind of like debrief. And what I told them is what I'm going to tell you now. Um, and I don't know if it's in all special forces circles, but I definitely know at the, the Joint Special Operations Command, one of the things that they pride themselves on is the ability to receive a call and within some set period of time, You've got all of your logistics together and you've got your people and your wheels up and you're on your way. It was a challenge to get all of this organized within about eight. We basically from the time that we got the call around 10 a.m. on Monday until 4.30, we had to organize everything. We had to be completely self-sufficient going in and out of Asheville. And we were able to do that. A bunch of random people, I say random, friends and some slightly extended friends were able to come together and uh, a diverse, highly qualified team were, were willing to answer the call and be ready, fully ready within that time period and show up at 4.30 on time and not a darn one of them got any sleep either. They were all concerned. We were able to go down there. We made the path. We executed on the plan. We did We did not get our idealized amount of time to find the items. We had setbacks that we overcame. We had multiple setbacks actually on the equipment, but we overcame. We brought all of our equipment home, although I lost my boots somewhere, but we got all of our equipment home and all of our people home. Nobody got in trouble. Nobody got hurt. And... Um, we were able to make it back generally with no problems. That's a highly successful mission. And if it's good enough for the special forces, that's a reasonable enough uh, to ask for a bunch of civilians on a moment's notice to snap on and to, to, to jump into a highly uncertain terrain. So, um, you know, the last thing I want to do here is I want to give out, you know, the kudos to this team. Uh, definitely to Sean for answering the call. He's not normally part of our like group group. And so for him to do that and provide security was like immensely appreciated. And it definitely gave me a lot of peace of mind that we got somebody who's like a pro. Um, certainly to Jason uh, with his kind of like various useful skills, like uh, his uh, for one, bringing his equipment, which was definitely needed. Um, that was a massive force multiplier. And if we were able to get the kinds of goods that we had that we were getting ready to go, we were absolutely going to need that trailer. Um, and we did use it for, for just a couple things. But um, 
you know, the fact that we were going to have a medic on, on hand as well as a former police officer to help kind of do the people-y thing. Awesome. Uh, for Tyler, for uh, being extremely prepared. He had all the tools we needed, all the contingency tools that we needed, and was ready to rock and roll and was in there and pulling stuff apart. Uh, to Robert for kind of the same thing. Um, being able to tell us definitively what the status is of that power and being able to remove that power uh, wherever uh, it was going to present dangers. Couldn't be more immensely grateful. I know you don't think it's a big deal because it's like, well, it's all dead. So whatever. We don't know that, but you know that. Um, so super, super thankful for that. Uh, certainly for uh, Zach for for helping us out. Um, really plussed up the um, manpower of moving stuff out of the way. And I don't think, you know, certainly Leland for helping to organize and get the logistics and getting us there, doing exactly what you said you were going to do, which was getting us uh, down that, that path safely to and from there. So uh, couldn't be more proud to be part of that team. And I'm glad we did it. Uh, yeah, we didn't get the number one things that we were due, but setbacks happen. But um, that's kind of the end here. And I just lastly want to encourage you that if, if you've watched this, that sometimes the time you're, it's going to be your time and your shoulder is going to get tapped, proverbially tapped for you to go and extend your neck out and try to go do a bunch of things that you've never, that you're uncertain that you can do, let alone get it done in time. And, uh, but I encourage you to, to put one foot in front of the other and don't allow, be the one who has the strength and the stability to ensure that the thing happens. Insist on meeting on time and leaving on time and being prepared and you be double prepared. <clears throat> so while everybody else gets the luxury of just, um, just kind of showing up and doing their thing, you be the one to do the planning, to do the, to do the thinking, to do the organizing and bringing people together. Um, oftentimes this stuff happens in a very short amount of time. You should definitely do some planning. You definitely need to look at the routes, even if they aren't going to be the routes, you need to be double prepared as prepared as you possibly can, given the time that you have. And seek out those moments that um, where you will be tested, because again, in hindsight, we'll remember this day uh, for the rest of our lives as the day that when we got the call, we answered it and we showed up. And I believe that th those times will be coming for you, and um, I hope that you answer them. Well, uh, that's all I have for this uh, this video about the expedition to Asheville. Uh, I hope it was enlightening. Um, and I, I can't understate the amount of damage that is in Asheville, especially in comparison to, uh, around here. It's not to say it, not to trivialize anything that's around here, but the level of devastation down there is, is next level. It's, it's, it's pretty intense, but there's also a lot of energy there to do repairs and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's all relative, I guess, but, um, I, I think that's all I got for this video. Uh, I'm going to be putting out some additional videos on this, like our experiences here during the, the hurricane and some of our preparedness as well as our lessons learned so that you can uh, learn from our lessons learned uh, and be more prepared in the future. Uh, and that's all I've got. I'll see you.